Good morning. morning. Greetings in the name of our great Savior, Jesus. Welcome all of you to the worship of the living God, the God who is certainly great and worthy to be praised, isn't he? He is. Amen, indeed. It's good to have you with us this morning. We want to extend a welcome if you're visiting with us. We pray the Lord will bless you as you join us this morning, and uh, it is great to have you here with us. Let's take a minute. Ask God by his spirit to uh, prepare us, to fill us, to lead us and guide us, and uh, well, we could just keep going down the list, to guard us, right, to maybe wake us up a little bit more, I don't know, however you've arrived. He, uh, the, the invitation this morning is that he is seeking you. As much as we um, are here for him, he's, he is here for us even more. The, uh, the invitation is certainly there on that cross, that he gave us his son, that we might be with him, that we might be his people. And so be of uh, good confidence you come to a God who seeks you with all his heart this morning. Let's ask him by his spirit to come and and, uh, just help us to be mindful of him, to put aside, you know, to not be distracted, put aside plans, but just to really make this a spirit-filled worship, not just done in order and in truth, but in his presence. So I'm going to encourage you to begin with us that way and Uh, Join us in a time of preparatory prayer to start, and then we'll have our invocation to follow that. So why don't we stand and begin. I invite you this morning to open your Bibles with us to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. We are beginning this morning our study in the Sermon of the Mount stretches in Matthew's Gospel from chapter 5 into chapter 7, and uh, most famously begins with what is often called the Beatitudes, and that's uh, verses, uh, well, right at the beginning of chapter 5 there, verse 1 to 10, really, and this morning, we are, we're going to begin our study of those Beatitudes and really focus on the first three, essentially, but uh, I want to read for us that whole section And uh, start and ask God to help us to hear his word as we look at it together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. What would we have or be without your long-suffering patience in our life? I pray even now as we come to your word, we consider, even as Bill reminded us, that your posture to those who who are broken, who are desperate for your goodness, Lord, you do not withhold anything, that you delight in showing mercy and kindness. We pray that as we come to your word, the Lord, you would render our hearts open by your Holy Spirit, that we would be both eager and humble to listen, that I would be used by that same Spirit, Lord, to proclaim it in truth and in the power of your Spirit so that Christ would get glory clearly seen by us all, and we, your people, The church would be blessed and nourished. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, who is the king and head of this church. In his name we pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Let's listen carefully now. This is God's word. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he had sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you and falsely, uh, against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word of the Lord. One of the most remarkable things ever said by a human being was said by Jesus 
much later in this gospel, he, he, he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but, my, but not my words. I want us to think as we just begin our study of the Sermon on the Mount of that claim. I mean, if I said to you this morning that what I was about to say right now was going to be so influential, so absolutely kind of necessary for all humanity that it would be kind of fixed even beyond like the lifespan of creation, that it wouldn't just be remembered, but it would be studied, you know, long after I'm gone. You might think all that healthy salad eating has gone to my head, but um, we live in a world that where we have access to and share all kinds of ideas constantly, right? We're just, we live in an information-saturated life. So we've got all these profound quotes that maybe we read or share or come across, hundreds upon hundreds, pithy little sayings, and even as the most profound and wisest things, maybe even sometimes got written and kept in books, really they don't get remembered past a couple generations. Even something I read on Monday, I barely remember it Tuesday. But to say that your words will be fixed eternally and outlast creation, that draws our attention, doesn't it? Jesus said it. He said, my word is actually eternal, eternally true, eternally significant, eternally important. No matter how long you've been in church or have studied the Bible or even may have read Matthew's gospel and this famous Sermon on the Mount, you've likely heard some part of this famous sermon. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, see if you can pass your Sermon on the Mount test. If someone strikes you on the cheek, you should turn. There you go. Uh, judge not, lest you be judged, right? Don't look, you know, look for the speck in your own eye. Don't look for the log, excuse me, in your, I'm going to fail the test. <laughs> Why do you look for the speck in your own eye? In your brother's eye, not the log in your own. Uh, ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will knock and it'll be so you 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 you've heard these do unto others kids you hear this all the time don't you as you would have what them do to you right yeah you must really love pain and suffering if you cheer for the toronto maple leafs <laughs> i might have added that one <laughs> so we need to ask as we start to think about what makes this sermon so eternally important the short answer for you, I'll give you the Coles notes, is it's, it's Jesus. Because it is about him. The longer answer, as you'll unpack it, is it's about life with him, in him. Why it's important to not just know about him, but submit to him, to his lordship. That long answer is what the sermon is based on. And this very famous sermon that he says, among all his other words, will outlast even the universe. Spells out for you what wisdom in his kingdom looks like. What life lived for God, what faith in Christ is meant to look like. So this is a sermon that the Son of God gives us that he says, I want to boil down all of what life should be about in a sermon. And it actually comes in a very condensed form at the beginning in this Beatitudes. And we have, we have sort of two themes, or really one phrase, that he says, here's what I'm going to unpack. The blessing of kingdom life. The blessing of the kingdom of heaven. I mean, that's why he starts with this word, blessed, 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 blessed. He's going to cover the what the who and the how of this kingdom blessing for you in a few short verses. What is the blessed kingdom? Who gets in? How is that even possible? Notice first, what is this kingdom of heaven? What is the kingdom that Jesus speaks 
so much about. If you've read anything from his Gospels, you know he is always talking about a kingdom, either the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. It is the first thing he actually says in this sermon, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And if you look right down at the bottom of the Beatitudes, depending on how you divide them, it is the last thing, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And it's not just here in the opening comments in this sermon, of course, he talks about the kingdom all the time. In John 3, when he's talking to Nicodemus and he's telling him he has to be born again, he says it's so that you can enter the kingdom of heaven. In Mark 1, 5, Jesus boils down his whole gospel message to one thesis. In 1, excuse me, 15, he says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. You need to repent and believe in this gospel, he says. And then he goes on basically to give us all kinds of parables to try to describe for us what the kingdom is like. When he wants to comfort you, he says things like, fear not, little flock, it's your father's good pleasure to give you what? Yeah, kingdom. In Luke 22, he says, I was assigned the kingdom so that I could pass on the kingdom to you and that you could have the unshakable foundation of life. He uses that phrase. The kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is why Jesus is preaching here. So we, let's start with this. Well, what is it? Well, what happens when a new ruler, a new leader comes into power? When a new king is crowned or uh, a new prime minister is voted in, you get a new boss for your business or your job. What happens? Well, there's a new reign. You might want to say your boss has a reign, but I mean, there's a new administration, new rules to govern you. And depending on how good and wise that ruler or king or prime minister is, you will or will not be blessed, right? It'll affect you. So Proverbs 29, 2 says, when the righteous increase, people rejoice. When the wicked rule, people groan. Some of you are groaning. Uh, so from the moment Jesus' ministry begins, he announces that his coming means the kingdom of God has come, right? There's a new world order, an administration, he'll talk about, of hope and love and peace. In Luke 4, he actually, 42, he says, I, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns. And in Matthew 12, 28, he says, but if it was by the spirit of God that I cast out demons... Remember that moment? He says, well, if it is, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. How is it possible? Well, because where there is a king, there is a kingdom. Where there's a king, there's a kingdom. Precisely, this is why Jesus says to the Pharisees in Luke 17, he says, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Right? They were waiting for it. He says, no, it's come. Because wherever he is, the kingdom of God is. Wherever his grace and power come with his presence, that's the kingdom of God. That's why you're called to pray for it to come as it is in heaven on earth. Wherever he is, he brings his kingdom. But what will be clear is that this kingdom, this new world order that Christ is ushering in in our lives through us is not at all what we expect. It's definitely contrary to the way our world builds its kingdoms. It's actually the opposite, isn't it? And he's going to make it clear right from the outset of this Beatitudes with statements like poverty and mourning and, and meekness. But he's going to go on to say things like, like, in his kingdom, the last are going to be first. Right? Servants, slaves are the leaders. In order to be wise, you have to be willing to look like a fool. Weakness is strength in his order of things. Persecution, he's going to say here, is actually going to lead to blessing. Mourning is the path of comforting it's going to be better to give than to receive. You're actually going to have to believe first if you want to know. All these ways. He says, this is how my kingdom works. And now in this Sermon on the Mount, he's going to show you what that looks like. And he begins with these beatitudes, a list of blessedness is, as it were. An introduction of his sermon on the kingdom life. And, a, and it sets, I want us to appreciate this morning, a stunning tone. Not just talking about the kingdom, but he's telling us that there is real blessing to be had in your life. Can we appreciate the constant repetition of blessed and blessed and all the way down? 
It's not just an order of a kingdom, but it's a whole new kind of life. And he uses this word blessed to describe it more than any other word. Start there. Because this is the true nature of his kingdom. He uses the word makarios, to be blessed. And it can sometimes mean like we use it happy or carefree. But he's connecting it with words like poverty and mourning and meekness. So it's, it's got to mean something more profound. And not just to do with happy, but of, of wholeness, of not, you know, completeness, not lacking anything. Blessing. This is the promise of the better life. The full life. A lot of the Psalms, 1 and 32, they all start blessed. So this is what the sermon is about. He says, primarily, when you come under my reign, when you come into my kingdom and call me king, there's, this is the blessed life. We all hear the words. We've all heard them talk like this. This is, you are blessed if you do this. This is where real blessing lies. What I want to start and just ask as we consider these words is, so why don't I often experience this? We, we throw the word around a lot. I know we use the word blessed, hashtag blessed. Oh, I was blessed. I found a dollar on the ground. Oh, I was blessed. But that's not really the, how Jesus is using the word. This blessed life that he's talking about, this kingdom of what he'll talk about, comfort and peace and an inheritance of like the world. How do we miss it? If you're honest, you, the words, they sound great, but maybe you're here and you're going, well, why don't I have that life? Why do we miss what Jesus says is what we should be living? Uh, Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher, talked about how he likened us to ducks that we don't realize we can fly. This is his illustration. Uh, the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard addressed the, what he saw as a problem in the church he used this illustration how Christians' troubles really stem from failing to see how faith should be lived out. Really, how we, why we miss this, this kingdom life, that there's this huge gap between what we say we believe and what it looks like in our life. And so in one instance, he uses this parable called Duckland. I don't know if you've heard it. But anyways, it was, he, he talks about how it was the Sunday morning and all the ducks came dutifully to church, waddling through the doors, down the aisle, into their pews, and they comfortably squatted. Now this is his parables, not mine, so if there's any similarities, it's just completely coincidental. Anyways, they're all settled in, they sung their hymns, they were sung, and the minister waddled up into the pulpit, and he read from his little duck Bible, and he said, Ducks, you have wings. You can fly like eagles. You can soar. Use your wings. Fly. Is this marvelous, you know, inspirational scripture, and they all quacked with heartal consent and said their amens, and maybe they were Baptist ducks. Presbyterians would just nod their head, but um. Anyway, so Kierkegaard concludes, he says, and when it was all done, you know, they're all in a fervor, they were all convinced and all excited, and they just plopped down out of their pews, then they waddled home. And he's kind of recognizing what we do see sometimes Jesus' address and his words here about the blessed life and yet sometimes there's this chasm between what he says we should be living like and how we are living. Do we have the blessed life? Why not? Jesus says, well, here's how you fly, ducks. This is the entrance to the kingdom life and it's we miss it sometimes because it's not where we naturally orient ourselves. There are three things or three character traits about a Christian, about the, if we, another analogy is the door into the kingdom of heaven that we miss. These are the reasons why we know we can fly, but we don't fly. Jesus says it has to do with poverty, mourning, and meekness. Jesus says, this is who gets in. This is, this is the blessed life. These are the ones that are learning to fly. These are kingdom people. Poverty, mourning, meekness. Notice first, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
What's it mean to be poor? It's the first feature. Jesus starts here. It's the first thing you need to know. Poverty, of course, means to lack resources, to be void of money. Um, this is pretty much a great description for my whole college life. Um, I went to school in Toronto, and so they, they had something at the time, I think it was like three-for-one pizzas. Pizza you had to kind of put in bracket to describe whether it was technically that, but we'd buy that and put it under our bed and live off that for the week. But even, you know, kind of my poverty looks like wealth compared to what most of the world lives like. If you uh, live in drought-scorched Ethiopia or war-torn Sudan, Poverty is a foreign idea to most North Americans. But what does it mean to be poor in spirit? How can you be so spiritually bankrupt that you're actually impoverished? Well, it has to do with realizing, of course, this implication, is that you lack any kind of resource for what's necessary in life really necessary though that there that there's a posture it's more than just a posture of a weakness but it's a poverty of spirit means that you have a realization that i lack any kind of spiritual currency or value and i listen i know against our culture of self-help books and all the affirmations you are told you're great you are wonderful you can do everything just believe in yourself there's the inner you with power and like Jesus says kingdom life begins with a spiritual poverty. Think about this. Not just a, a realization of it, but admission of it. An admission that I have a complete spiritual inability. And that while I might be quite capable with finances in my life and be able to purchase what I want, and I might be able to hold all the necessary information and have a competent intellect and you know, function in a job the way I'd like, and I, have, I might have health, I might have relational integrity and intellectual and physical resources, but when it comes to how God measures ability, how he measures competency, and he sees my inner resources, I am bankrupt. Utterly poor. What is most important, what I need most for spiritual, eternal blessing is to admit that I'm poor. Utterly incapable of obtaining this blessed life on my own. The writer D.A. Carson says, Poverty of spirit is the personal acknowledgement of spiritual bankruptcy. It is the conscious confession of unworth and inability before God. That, says Jesus, is where kingdom life begins. The prophets were already talking to them like this. Isaiah 57, verse 15. For thus says the one who is on high, lifted up, who inhabits eternity, his name is holy. I dwell in a high and holy place also with him who is of contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly. Poor in spirit is when you know there's nothing in you. Has not, you don't have no family connections, no occupation, no morality, no, no intellect, no skill, no good works, no church reputation. Nothing, nothing can commend you to God. Alcoholics Anonymous knew this, right? They always say the first step is to admit that we're powerless over our problems. I'm pretty sure Jesus didn't borrow that from them. Thomas Goodwin, the Puritan, preaches a sermon on this verse. It's really worth reading. He says, until we are poor in spirit, we are not capable of receiving grace. He who is swollen with self-excellency and self-sufficiency is not fit for Christ. He is full already. If the hand of, is full of pebbles, it can't receive gold. The glass has to be emptied before you pour in the wine. He keeps, you get the point, right? God first empties a man of himself before he pours in the precious wine of his grace. None but the poor in spirit are with Christ's commission. So what is the most important resource needed to start your journey into the kingdom of heaven? A confession that you have no resource to get into it in the first place. That you are poor, we are spiritually bankrupt. 
You ready to admit that? It leads to the second thing. Because those, Jesus says, who are starting to walk through this door of the kingdom have done more than just admit I can't do it, but they have to confess it. So now he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So what is the mourning that Jesus is referring to here? Um, well, just as the poverty is a spiritual one, we're gonna, it's fair to assume that theme, that mourning, is connected to that. So the poverty of spirit has to do with being aware of my problem and inability. So the mourning has to do with confessing it, repenting of it. This is, listen to me, a absolutely essential step to take. It gets missed a lot. Because you can be aware of a problem, even admit it, but not confess it. Not have a mourning over it. I am selling my car this week for a fraction of what I bought it for. And to look at it, because it's in really, really good shape externally, you would be stunned, as are the many Facebook marketplace people who annoy me now still. But I posted clearly on it what's wrong with it. The engine does not work. And I had warnings. Um, I had reason to believe there was something wrong. It was started with leaking oil and doing some odd things. And I knew it, but I didn't act on it, at least not in time, until it left Ben in Algonquin Park, stranded on the road. So I formally apologized to my son, Benjamin. But I knew it. I, I knew it had a problem, but I didn't address it until it was too late. Mourning is the next step if you're going to begin with admitting that you're spiritually bankrupt. The Bible says our repentance is like mourning for sin. That is the posture of dealing with it appropriately, confessing it. It is a personal grief over personal sin against a holy God. You hear me? Isaiah famously in chapter 6 is ushered into the presence of God and the angels are worshiping him, trembling. His presence makes the very thresholds of heaven shake. And Isaiah's response isn't, wow, this is great. It is, woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell amongst an unclean people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Paul, after he talks about his own spiritual poverty in Romans 7, concludes in verse 24, Wretched man am I. Who will deliver me from this body of death? By the way, his answer is, thanks be to God through who? Jesus Christ, our Lord. Sin in our culture is not grieved. You don't need to be told that. It's not deplored. It's, it's, it's not even merely tolerated. It's celebrated. Our society doesn't mourn its sin. They mourn those who mourn sin. And Jesus says, you want to learn to fly in my kingdom? To the degree that you learn to mourn for your sin, you will avail yourself of heaven's comfort. See those words? David knew. David, King David knew his lack of comfort in his life was because he failed to repent and mourn. In Psalm 51, he's like, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your, un your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgression. Wash me from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. And then he says, That's how joy will be restored to me. To grieve sin is to mourn over the reality that I, on some level, have rejected God. The word pentheo means mourn, lament, to grieve. But in order to do that, maybe a, to appreciate what is sin, it's more than just breaking rules. The Bible says it's essentially rejecting God. From the moment Adam and Eve did it to you know, all the way through, it's, it's at its core. It may have its effect or its fruit in your life of lying, stealing, coveting, adultery. But where it comes from is deep down at some moment you said no to God. I'm my own boss. I'll choose this. I'll discern this. I'll do this on my own. Why should you grieve that? James says in chapter 4 verse 9, Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. I know not a hallmark verse, but it's an important one. 
See, sin is the unwillingness to confess your utter dependence on God. Romans says it's a failure to worship him and acknowledge him as God. Jesus tells a parable in Luke 15. It's like the son who just rejects his father and all that he's given him. And our unwillingness to admit that and confess it is what's crippling us and enslaving us, says the Bible, and separating us from God and keeping us in bondage. And actually worse, it makes you spiritually dead. And Jesus says, until you learn to mourn that sin as a personal rejection of God, you will never see the kingdom of heaven. Ever. The doctrine of sin, confessing and mourning over ours, you're starting to point towards the door of the kingdom. Truly blessed is the person who sees their poverty of spirit and mourns over it and repents because of it. Jesus says, they will be comforted. Thirdly, the blessed life is the kingdom that begins with acknowledging my spiritual poverty, mourning over my sin. So what happens when that starts to be, kind of take shape in your life, the spiritual poverty and mourning over sin, Jesus says it creates, see the word, meekness. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Again, what does he mean by meek? What's the difference between poverty and meekness? Well, spiritual poverty, we said, is acknowledging my inability, mourning over it, is realizing it's an offense to God, but now meekness is the posture of humility that it creates in me. It creates the approach to God in my life. It's not weakness. It's a focus on the other. Martin Lloyd-Jones also preaches on this. He says, the person that's truly meek is the one who is amazed that God, or a person, can think of him as they do and treat them as well as they do. We are to leave everything, ourselves, our rights, our causes, our future, in the hands of God. Meekness. And that's what's produced in us when you start to see your spiritual poverty, when not to see you're unable to do anything with God, but that actually you offend him and you mourn over that sin, and that brokenheartedness produces meekness. And that's this character of no longer needing or worrying about justifying yourself to people, proving yourself, getting glory for yourself. That's the posture. I'm not worried about grabbing and taking and getting Actually, not taking is how you obtain, he says. See that? The person who demands nothing gets everything. The meek, blessed are the meek, for they'll inherit the earth. The words in the same family of lowly and gentle and humble. James says in chapter 4, verse 6, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Jesus is taking probably this, this principle here from Psalm 37, verse 11, In just a little while the wicked will be no more. Though you'll look carefully at his place, he won't be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. Are you listening? Poverty, mourning, meekness. These are the wings that fly in the kingdom. This is the way in. Not the self-confident that are blessed, but the poor in spirit. Not the excuse-making or the finger-pointing, but those who mourn. Not the prideful, but the meek. Hosea prophesied in chapter 2, 23, God says, I will have mercy on no mercy. I will say to not my people, you are my people. God loves to show himself strong, by being the strength of the weak, he says, I love to show mercy to those who don't have mercy. I love to call a people who aren't my people, my people. In, to the response of the religious pride and the puffed upness, Jesus says to the Pharisees, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Apparently at one point, uh, the famous writer G.K. Chesterton was invited to write to the London Times with a bunch of other writers, and they, all, they asked them what they all thought was the problem of the world today. 
So they went and got all the most famous and competent writers. They said, write us an essay on what you feel is the most, what is the thing that is the problem with this world today. And, and G.K. Chesterton, who confessed Christ, simply wrote one line. He said, the problem with the universe is me. Meekness. Three character traits. The heart that is starting to step through that kingdom, the kingdom door. The reasons we fail to really fly is because they're just so glaringly countercultural and insulting, but poverty, mourning, meekness. This, says Jesus, is who gets into the kingdom. This is the blessed life. Here's where you start to learn to fly. Poor in spirit, mourning for sin, meekness. Now, I want to I ask this. It's really important. It's the question of how can someone who is poor in spirit and mourns over their sin and, and has a meek kind of caricature, how do they fly? I mean, honestly, in our world, if you said it's poverty of spirit that inherits the kingdom and it's mourning over sin that is how you get comforted, this, this doesn't, this isn't our world order, is it? The, the meek inherit theirs. We're told the last, only the losers finish last. The answer comes in the next verse. We're going to unpack this next week, but can I just leave this with you? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. See that? There's the answer. Through, there is a righteousness that your poverty can inherit the kingdom. There is a righteousness that your mourning can be comforted. There is a righteousness that will cause the meek to inherit the earth. Now you need to say, well, how do I get this righteousness? And the answer is, just look who's preaching. First, do you know why Jesus is delivering this sermon on a mountain? Um, this is not a list of so many people turn this sermon and the Beatitudes into a bunch of self-help suggestions to better your life. This is the blueprints for kingdom life. And they're only received at the feet of Jesus. These sermons are not about moral, wise life hacks. This is about him. He's the door to the kingdom. He's the righteousness that you have to receive. Do you understand me? This is a sermon calling you this morning to submit to him. You might not hear the words, but this is what it's calling to. Matthew's gospel you might remember, just a few chapters earlier, begins with a genealogy, right? Long list of names. That's the thing you skipped over in your Bible reading program. But it starts with Abraham, and it goes to David, and it's basically saying, he's the Messiah King. That's how it begins. And then it ends in Matthew 28 with the Great Commission, right? He tells his disciples to go spread the gospel. And before he gives them the commission, he makes this admission, and he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So he, Matthew starts with, this king has all authority, and then he ends with, this king has all authority. And here in chapter 5, it starts like seeing the crowds, he goes up on a mountain, he sat down, and his disciples came to him. M Mountains are really important in Matthew's gospel, they're important in the Bible. But even in Matthew's gospel, we, we see Jesus on mountains getting tempted, he goes up to pray, he heals multitudes, he's transfigured. There's an Olivet Discourse on a mountain. There's a great commission there. All through the Bible, when God specifically met with his people, he often brought them up on a mountain, most famous Mount Sinai, where Moses got the law. He received word from God. A mountain is where we kind of connect with him, where he reveals himself to us. And here he's on a mountain. He's telling us this. Here is who gets into the kingdom. And he's showing you how it's possible. He is speaking to you as the one who has the authority to speak as God to you. This is your mountaintop experience this morning. He says, I'm the righteousness you need. The question is, will you submit to him? Why, why should you submit? Why should you acknowledge your spiritual poverty? Why should you mourn for your sin and come meekly to God? Just look who's preaching to you. This is the Prince of Heaven who willingly became poor. This is the Messiah who mourned over your sin. This is the Son of God who willingly came meekly to you. 
Do you understand? This is the prince of heaven who came and became poor. He laid aside his glory. Now Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, because through his poverty you become rich. Thomas Goodwin, in that same sermon, he says, Until we're poor in spirit, Christ will never be precious. Until we see our own wants, we will never see Christ's worth. Poverty of spirit is salt and seasoning, which makes Christ's relish sweet to the soul. Mercy is most welcome to the poor in spirit. He who sees himself clad in filthy rags will he give for change of raiment the righteousness of Christ. You can be poor in spirit. You can admit it because the one who was rich became poor for you. You can submit to this king because this is the holy one who came and he mourned. I mean, he didn't mourn for his sin. In all of his prayers that he prayed, he never once had to mourn for sin because he never sinned. But he did, was brokenhearted. He did weep. He did look at us as lost sheep and it broke his heart because we sin. And the, and the way you can come and confess your sin and mourn over yours is because he didn't just mourn over yours, he conquered it. He conquered it with his blood. You can mourn over it because you can celebrate his grace. Like imagine if I sent you a text. We're coming up to July 4th in a little bit. And I said, look, let's go watch Canada Day fireworks. Let's meet at 11 a.m. And you'd think it might be a typo, but, right? Because you can't watch fireworks in the morning. They're not impressive at all. You probably can't even see them. Grace is all the more brilliant when it's set against the backdrop of the blackness of our sin. Thomas Watson, another Puritan, said, Till sin be bitter, Christ will not be sweet. This word for grieving is this, you know, to our culture, it's regressive and restricting. It's something you get away from. For the Christian, Jesus says, this is the pathway to joy. Imagine the implications of these words for you this morning. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. There's comforting if you'll mourn. That's the gospel. And Paul says in Romans 8, one, therefore now there is no longer any what? condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. That's how your mourning can be turned to gladness. That's, how, that's the comfort. And that means you don't have to hide when you come to God. You don't have to, you don't have to kind of hide from anybody else. You don't have to be, be kind of overwhelmed. You can come right down to the depth of your sin and kind of just open up your heart to him because no matter how deep you go, you're going to find his grace there. That's how you can submit to the son who mourned for you. One last thing. This is the very son of God who became meek. This still just is stunning. That the one who, who is the, the logos, the incarnate word, John 1, who Colossians says by him and through him and for him are all things. He made all things by his will. He holds the universe together. And when he comes to us, he doesn't kind of flash and flex. He's, he reveals his heart. And in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, he says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me. I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. That's the same word for meek, in case you didn't. Gentle. Dane Ortland writes a great book, Gentle and Lowly, about those words. He says, meek and humble and gentle Jesus. He's not harsh and reactionary. He, he, he isn't easily exacerbated. He, he's the most understanding person in the universe. The posture most natural to him is not a pointed finger, but open arms. You don't need to be to be unburdened or collect yourself and then come to Jesus. He says, your very burden is what qualifies you to come. No payments required. He says, I'll give you rest. His rest is gift, not transaction. 
gentle and lowly. He says, that's his testimony. It's Christ's very heart. It's who he is. Welcoming, open. You see why I say this is, our, this is your mountaintop experience this morning. You want to submit to your king? This is the prince of heaven who became poor for you. This is the Messiah who mourned for your sin. This is the very son of God willing to be meek and gentle to you. It's true, ducks. We can fly. <laughs> you have wings. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn. They'll be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we ask for your grace.